Okay, so have you got your Bibles? We've got a lot to get through, so I need to press on. So if you turn to 1 Corinthians 11, I'm going to read some verses, and then later I'm going to flip into the Old Testament. That's why we haven't got the words on to save Johnny the task of flipping from one to the other. So do bear with me. 1 Corinthians 11. Father, we just commit this word to you. We thank you that we have your living word. Thank you for the privilege of gathering to hear you speak. I want to pray, Holy Spirit, that you bring clarity to my thoughts and words and anointing that it would, this would impart faith and enlarge our vision of the God that you are so that we might worship you more in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're starting in 1 Corinthians 17. I'm going to talk about the Lord's Supper or Communion or the Eucharist, I think is that the appropriate title, uh, and the Passover Supper as well. So 1 Corinthians 11, we're beginning at verse 17. This is the Apostle Paul speak, writing to the church at Corinth. He says, in the following directives, <clears throat> I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and ill and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regards to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Anyone who is hungry should eat something at home, so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. And when I come... I will give further instruction. Not a particularly uplifting passage to start with, is it? Now, the background to the Apostle's letter is he's writing to a church that is, frankly, in awful disunity. It was a church that used to uh, kind of compete with each other for spiritual gifts. You know, I bring prophecy more, I can speak in tongues longer than you. They tried to outdo each other. So clearly... Pride was a very common issue. There was sexual immorality left unchallenged by the leaders in the church. There was a lack of love, a prejudice going on, a kind of favoritism. Oh, I don't sit with them because they're poor, you know. It was a church that was also rejecting the apostles' authority and uh, call to serve them because he wasn't charismatic enough. And so some preferred Peter and some preferred Apollo. And all these areas of division and disunity become very evident when they gather to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And so he begins this passage with a condemnation. He says, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. My goodness, can you imagine hearing that? Your meetings do more harm than good. What a thing to say. But the point he's addressing is this, guys, we can go through the motions of church. 
We can do the things of church. But if our hearts are not right, if we're not loving one another, if our motives are selfish, if we are harboring unforgiveness towards one another, then we will do more harm than good. And then when we come to take the Lord's Supper, the truth is, if we are harboring these things in our heart, we are not taking the Lord's Supper. We're just going through some religious activity. And so it's in this context that Paul teaches about the Lord's Supper, what it's about, what its purpose is. For it's an occasion when disunity will be brought to the surface as we begin to realise and be reminded that actually we are one family. It's an occasion to remind us how totally undeserving we are to even partake of the bread and wine and therefore how grateful we ought to be. It's a time when we realise how freely we have been loved and forgiven and therefore how freely we ought to love and forgive one another so the more we understand what Jesus intended this occasion to mean to us the more we can safeguard the unity of our church so to fully appreciate what this is all about we're going to go back to the very first Passover. And we're going to see what the Passover meant on its first occasion and subsequent occasions to those whom God was drawing to be his people. So I'm going to read to you now, if you want to turn, you're welcome to Exodus chapter 12. I'm going to read the first 14 verses, then jump on a few verses and pick it up again at verse 21. So this is Exodus 12. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for the whole lamb, they must share with their nearest neighbour, having taken into account the number of people they are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you must take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water but roast it over fire with the head, legs and internal organs. Do not leave any of it till the morning. If some is left till morning you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste, it is the Lord's Passover. On that same night I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are and when I see the blood I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. Then jumping on to verse 21. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the door frames. None of you shall go out of the door of your house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the door frame and will pass over that doorway, and he will not permit the destroyer to empty, enter your house and strike you down. 
Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you as he promised, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people bowed and worshipped. The Israelites did just what the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. Now, a little background here, which you probably know, so forgive me for just telling you what you do know. Uh, God's people had been slaves to the Egyptians for many, many years. And God calls Moses to become their leader and to go to Pharaoh and appeal to Pharaoh to set his people free. Pharaoh, his heart is hardened. We know from Scripture that it was God who was hardening his heart in order that God would bring these plagues that would demonstrate his power and his might and also demonstrate to his people, who didn't really know him because they'd been slaves for so long in Egypt, but to demonstrate to his people who he was. They needed to learn that. So God brings a series of plagues on the Egyptians because Pharaoh refuses to let them go. And for the first nine plagues, there was a distinction between the Egyptians and the people of God. None of these first nine affected God's people. None of them. They just observed what happened. In each of them, judgment came only to the Egyptians. But this final plague, this Passover plague, this angel of death going past and through the land was different. For this time... God came to judge the sin of his people as well as the Egyptians. Because during their time as slavery, in slavery, the Israelites had not honored God. They hadn't worshipped God. They'd actually fallen into idolatry and worshipped the Egyptians' idols. That's why these plagues were to demonstrate God's might and power over everything that Egypt worshipped. His people had rejected him. So their sin needed addressing. And so God's people needed protection also. Protection from this final act, this angel of death that would go through the land. As they also needed freedom from their sin. And it was this final act that was going to be the one that would set them free. And that judgment that God brought was to take the life of the firstborn of each family and indeed each herd. And for the Israelites, they were to take a hyssop branch and sacrifice a perfect lamb and smear the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of their homes. So as the angel of death came, where the angel saw the blood, it would not enter that home and bring God's judgment. The symbolism of all this was evident, particularly for us being able to look back. What God was saying is that his people needed a perfect substitute to pay for their sins. A spotless lamb was to be slain in their place. It's innocent blood was to be a sign that the judgment had been paid and that, interestingly, the size of the lamb was dependent on the size of the family, which made the whole thing very personal. You were involved in this. But also this was a demonstration of God's mercy to his people. For the Egyptians were not given this option. They weren't told about the blood on the doorposts because they were not God's people. And so this emphasized again to the Israelites that being God's people is special and it's God's choice that he'd called this nation and he was going to arrange a way that their sins could be paid for by an innocent sacrifice. 
And so they were saved from the judgment through their obedience and faith in God by smearing the blood. And so the angel passed over, thus we call it the Passover, the Passover meal. Please remember, and I'll bring this up later, when the angel passed over, it was not to do with who was in the room. The angel didn't check who was in the house and say, oh yeah, they're a nice bunch, I'll move on. It didn't matter who was in the room. What mattered is that God's people had had faith and obedience and smeared the blood. The angel saw the blood and moved on. Had there been no blood, oops, the angel would have visited that household. And every year, this act of being set free from slavery was to be remembered by a week's celebration concluding with a Passover meal. And this Passover meal was special. For this Passover meal was when the family would gather, not just in their own home, but all the families who were part of God's people. And it was a time or a meal when they were to remember we have been set free from our slavery. And the father of the house would tell the story to the family. So it passed on generation after generation. It was a time to remember we received mercy because the, Isra- the, Egyptianite, Egyptianites, the Egyptians didn't. We received the mercy of God by sacrificing an innocent, perfect lamb. It was a time when they humbled themselves. When you are given so much, the only conclusion should be that you're humbled. And it was also a time for them to be reminded that they were the people of God. He set them apart and demonstrated his grace and mercy upon them. So this Passover meal was full of symbolism to aid their memory. So, for example, we read that bitter herbs are to be eaten at this Passover meal, not the best starter you can offer somebody. But this was to remind them that they were slaves. They went through a bitter time. They were told to tuck their cloaks in their belt to remind them of the haste with which God said, now go. And they went, the haste with which God set them free. It was eaten by all the family together and all the families of the nation. It was to remind them, we are one people under God. And there before them on the table was a perfect lamb sacrificed for their freedom. A lamb without defect was slain so that they could be set free. This all pointed to a judgment they deserved but did not receive. This all pointed to the grace and mercy and love of God that they had been forgiven so freely. And this Passover meal had many steps. So as I say, there was a time when the uh, bitter herbs were eaten and then they'd have a glass of wine. Now, it's not like our glasses of wine, which frankly sometimes like half pints. So there's a number of glasses of wine in the Passover meal, so I can't imagine they're all rolling around drunk. I imagine it it was a small glass. So there were bitter herbs that were eaten, and then a glass of wine was taken. There would be a story. The father would recount what God had done on this occasion. And then latterly, when David wrote his psalms, what the Israelites used to do would be recite some of the psalms around 113 to 118. Read them when you've got time. So he would read those out as they spoke of what God had done. And then there was another small glass of wine. And then they ate the meal. And there was another glass of wine. This one was known as the cup of thanksgiving. They'd just eaten the sacrifice that had bought their freedom. And then there'd be another psalm read out, latterly of course, because David hadn't written them at the time of the first Passover. And then they had this final glass. And this final glass was known as the great halal. And this was a glass of victory. And so right at the end of the the, uh, Passover meal, 
the family would all raise their glass to the great halal. He was victorious. He set us free. We're the people of God. And this was their heritage for generations and generations. This reminded them they're God's people. But also pointed to what he had done and latterly to what he was going to do. For in the years to follow, the prophets began to speak about a time when God's people would not know him or follow him through laws written on stone, but through a personal relationship and intimacy. That there would be a Messiah that would come who would take this Passover to a new degree, which would be one of intimacy, individually knowing God through a relationship in their heart. And this all pointed to Jesus. He would be there and obviously our Passover lamb. So when we come to the New Testament and begin to read it, we can see deliberate comparisons that the New Testament writers make of the Passover lamb and Jesus Christ. What they do is they take the Passover, move it to the Lord's Supper, what Jesus did really, but in the middle of it they're saying, yes, but the new sacrificial lamb, the one that you had to sacrifice every year, is now the person of Jesus Christ, whose one sacrifice will do for all time. And we begin to read in the New Testament how the writers do this. So John 1 John describes Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes the sin of the world. Now there's a clear declaration. 1 Corinthians 5, Paul is very blunt. He says, for Christ, our Passover Lamb. And then in Revelation 5, we have that lovely picture about Jesus being described as the Lamb that was slain. Just as the Passover Lamb was to be perfect and not have a bone broken neither was Jesus a small point but it's something over the years I pick up that as Christians we sometimes say to one one another Christ's body broken for you actually can I just say in a friendly way that's that's not correct because it was prophesied that none of the bones of Jesus' body would be broken not because neither was the Passover lamb. Its bones were not to be broken. It was a perfect lamb when it was sacrificed. The guards pierced Jesus in the side, but no bone was broken. So a better phrase is Christ's body given for you, not broken for you. Jesus himself identifies himself as the Passover lamb. <clears throat> in Luke 22... At the Last Supper, the disciples all gather to celebrate the Passover meal, as was their instructions. And Jesus takes the place as the head of the family. And he says to them, this is my body, this is my blood. Now, it must have been quite a shock for them to hear that but in the context of the Passover they'd have clearly understood this was the Passover lamb we're looking at he's now giving his blood body and shedding his blood he was their Passover lamb and Jesus then emphasizes this great halal this final cup of victory on his journey to the cross In Mark 14, when sharing the Passover meal with the disciples, do you remember Jesus said, I will not drink it again until the kingdom of God. Jesus was not going to drink that final cup of victory until the kingdom of God had come. In Mark 14, on his, in the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prays, Father, take this cup from me. Why? Because Jesus clearly knows and sees and understands this is the cup of victory. And to get the cup of victory, the perfect sacrifice has to be slain. 
So he describes the whole occasion as, Father, take this cup. I don't want to be the one to do it. He was being real. But of course, he did. This was the cup that would bring us victory. On the way to the cross, do you remember? See how the writers weave it in? On the way to the cross, he was offered a drink. He declined because victory had not yet come. And then in John 19, when he's on the cross and with almost his final words, what does he do? He cries out for a drink. And what does he receive? He receives a drink of wine vinegar handed to him. And do you note, if you read it in John 19, John records that this drink, this wine vinegar, is handed it to him on what? A hyssop branch. And there's a final connection. Because it was the hyssop branch and the very first Passover that was to be dipped in the lamb's blood and drawn on the doorposts. And Jesus takes from that sponge and takes that final drink of wine and cries, it is finished. That was his declaration. The great halal, the victory, it's come. Now the kingdom can come. Now the price has been paid. Now he has bought our freedom. Now he is victorious and through his victory we also. <clears throat> and so he rises from the dead to bring in the new covenant that the prophets had spoken about for years. So as the Jews understood their final drink, the, gr the great halal, was to be a proclamation of God's victory. So also, we must see that when we take of our cup of wine, this is our cup of victory. He's won. He died and rose again. I have been set free. It's not a casual thing we do. But dear friends, neither is it a somber thing. Look at the similarities <clears throat> of their salvation through, seen through the Passover meal to our salvation seen through the Lord's Supper. So in the Passover, they were rescued from slavery in Egypt. In the Lord's Supper, we know and see and understand that we're rescued from slavery to sin. That control over us has been broken. In the Passover, they were rescued from judgment. They received mercy. In the Lord's Supper, we're reminded, I am drinking this through no work of my own. I have received mercy, not judgment. In the Passover, they ate the sacrificial lamb as their sub substitute, an act of faith in God's instructions to them. In the Lord's Supper, Jesus says, eat. This is my body. We take the bread. We receive his body symbolically by faith. I am part of Christ. In the Passover, they had many drinks of wine. Oh, sorry, they were reminded that another lamb had bought their redemption through its shed blood. In the Lord's Supper, we are reminded that Jesus bought our redemption through drinking of the wine or juice. Symbolic. His blood was shed for me. I'm in this new covenant. In the Passover, they had many drinks of wine, concluding with the cup of victory, the great halal. In the Lord's Supper, we drink the wine or the juice only once, just the victory cup. The door, it reminds us that the blood that Jesus shed has opened the door for me to enter into this new covenant, this new beautiful, intimate relationship with God. Now, both occasions, Passover and the Lord's Supper, are what we call covenant meals. In the Old Testament, they partook of it, not just the first time, but through the generations, because they were God's people. It was God's people who would partake of this. In the New Testament, 
We only partake of this if we are God's children because we've received Jesus Christ personally through our faith and our repentance and we've encountered the Holy Spirit coming into our heart and we begin to know that God's working within us. Participation of the Lord's Supper does not make us a child of God. Do, please don't be confused. Only our personal faith and repentance does that. But we partake of it because we're a child of God. So the Lord's Supper is so much more than a ritual. It shouts at us about what we have received, who we are, and what is to come. So how should we take this? Well, praise God, there's no specific rules. Otherwise, you know what we'd do. We'd make them so specific, they'd be constraining. But we could say this, the mood of taking the Lord's Supper is one of celebration. Because we're looking back, rejoicing in what Jesus has done. My sins have been forgiven. I know the mercy of God. We look around and say, amazing, God brought me into this family. I'm part of his covenant. And these are my brothers and sisters. And we look ahead, rejoicing in what lies ahead. The fulfillment of it all when Jesus returns. And we spend our eternity with him. So the mood is celebration. The activity is one of proclamation. Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 11, he says, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. So we're proclaiming the benefits that his death and resurrection have brought to me. Demons shudder when the people of God gather around the Lord's table. For we proclaim his victory. We Declare the great halal. We are redeemed. Jesus has conquered death. Defeated the devil. He's alive. And today he's setting more and more captives free. And one day he's coming back. Hallelujah. And my judgment has been paid for. But also the heart is one of unity. We're his family. We're together equally loved by God, equally receive the mercy of God. No one is more loved or better than the other. That's why we take of one loaf, symbolically speaking, one body. So, <clears throat> excuse me. let me go back to 1 Corinthians for a minute then. What's the meaning of those apparently harsh words that Paul says and the warnings that he gives about taking the Lord's Supper? Because remember, the context of Paul's letter is to a church in disunity. So I want to answer three questions quickly. What did he mean when he said taking it in an unworthy manner? How are we to examine ourselves? And what is this judgment we can bring upon ourselves? When Paul's speaking of taking it in an unworthy manner, it's to act contrary to the very benefits that Jesus' death and resurrection has brought us. And those are the benefits that we're proclaiming through participation. So, for example, if I'm taking the Lord's Supper, yet in my heart I don't love brothers and sisters in Christ equally, if I don't have any care or concern or compassion for others in need, if I hold unforgiveness... Or if I know I need to apologize, then I am a hypocrite in proclaiming that Jesus has died for me and given me freely all this love, grace and mercy. However, I'm not going to forgive him because he upset me. Or I don't like her because of her hairstyle or whatever. Do you see? That's the unworthiness that Paul's addressing. It's the disunity. If we've cliques or prejudice, if we're gossiping about one another, not having the best in our hearts for one another. Therefore, as we celebrate the, the forgiveness that Jesus has brought us, not to have that forgiveness and grace for one another is unworthy of my celebration around this table. So... <sighs> 
Is it, therefore, how do we examine ourselves? Well, we've all been in churches, I'm sure I've done it myself, where we go into a somber mood, and I was raised in a brethren church, I'm not saying all brethren churches are like this, but it was the most somber occasion, and we were meant to spend ten minutes reflecting on whether I was worthy enough to come to, to, come to the table. Look, I want, I want to tell you something. You're never going to be worthy to come to the table, okay? This isn't what Paul's talking about. However, you're always worthy to come to the table because your worthiness of coming to the table is not about you. It's about Jesus. Remember when the angel of death passed through the Passover? What was he looked for? Did he look inside the rooms to see if everyone's worthy? No, he saw the blood and he passed over. So my unworthiness is not about whether I've forgiven Laurie for being grumpy at me this morning, which she wasn't, by the way. Whether she's forgiven me or I've apologised. Whether I did something yesterday I shouldn't have done. That's not what Paul's talking about. He's talking about examining ourselves in the context of unity. So yes, it's right to take a minute. It's right to say, I know I'm worthy because of what Christ has done for me and my faith in Christ. However, if I am holding this disunity, if I'm holding unforgiveness, if I'm showing prejudice and a lack of love, if I'm not recognizing Christ's body as the body that Jesus has added me to, then I need to seek forgiveness before I partake. So it's that context he's talking about examining yourself in light of disunity do you need to ask for forgiveness do you need to repent of something you've done to offend someone else do you have you prejudice favoritism those things are not worthy of partaking the lord's supper those are the things we need to seek forgiveness for I don't suggest you rush up to someone before you take communion and say to them, I just want to forgive you. They may not even know what you're talking about. That would potentially make it a little more awkward. But you will know, the Holy Spirit will tell you, if you know that your attitude towards someone is not how Jesus' attitude towards you is. And you know if you need to address that, or if you, you also will know if you just need to deal with that quietly yourselves and if you do need to address it i suggest you do it after the event not before so what is this what is the god's judgment that paul talks about well just briefly it's basically to discipline our hypocrisy if we ignore scripture if we ignore everything that this means to us then god as a loving father will lovingly discipline us as he does in all cases of rebellion. So, who should therefore take communion? Who should gather around the Lord's table? Well, firstly, only, only those who know Jesus personally, who have received him through their faith and repentance. They know the Holy Spirit has come into their hearts because you're one of his family. You're in this new covenant. Only those who know in their hearts that they're in unity with brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's not just contained to our own local church. God doesn't see it like that. All brothers and sisters in Christ, have we got the right heart of unity and love? And then just uh, I'll throw something out. Children, I think it's a parent's call, but you need to be wise as to letting your children partake of this. It's a bit like baptism. There's a time when they need to understand what it means and they know they've made the right decision to do it. So I personally would say it's the parents' call, but I would advise don't rush it. Just make sure that they do see themselves as part of God's family. So as I close on this Father's Day, we're going to participate as one family. If you're not, a follower of Jesus Christ, if you, if you haven't received him and made him your Lord and Saviour, 
Guys, that's absolutely fine. We'd love to have you here and we thank you for sitting through all this and uh, we just say, don't participate, it's okay. We regularly have people who don't. Don't feel excluded at all. You're very much part of us, but in this occasion, it, I respect your integrity by saying, no, I'm not a Christian, therefore I'm not going to partake. So therefore, those who are followers of Jesus, who know God, have received the Holy Spirit, we are welcome to partake of those. However, guys, the mood is celebration. I used to go to a Baptist church, the way it was the most profound military exercise you'd ever witnessed taking communion. They would march in unison. And the highlight of, the, of your whole experience was to be promoted to carry the wine, but you had to have the right face to do it. And then when I perhaps understood things a bit, I just wanted to shout out, he won! <laughs> Which is why I'm no longer in a Baptist church, I guess. They threw me out. <laughs> so the activity, the mood is celebration. This is a family occasion. The activity is proclamation. He's coming again. And the heart is unity. I look around and thank God that you would love me and I love you. I'm part of his body, equally loved by you, uh, by brothers and sisters, and I'm seeking to equally love brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay? So let's take a moment. I'll just pray. And if you know there's an issue of disunity, unforgiveness, just bring that before the Lord. And if it's necessary you do something later on, then fine, commit to do that. And then after that, we'll partake together. Lord Jesus, I've tried to explain in simple words something so profound, it's beyond our understanding in its fullness. I've tried to describe something that you, in your amazing wisdom, have brought about. I just want to thank you that I'm part of this. I thank you I can take the bread and the wine and proclaim that you are my Lord my God, my Father, and you've saved me freely that the perfect sacrifice of Jesus has paid for my sin. Father, I want to proclaim you are victorious. I want to also say, Lord, I want my heart to be pure with my brothers and sisters. And I pray, Holy Spirit, you would help us grow more and more and more into a beautiful church of unity and mutual love for one another without prejudice, gossip or unforgiveness for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name.